anybody glad you know God today? I said, is anybody glad you know God today? I mean, I'm glad I know some people, but I'm glad I know God today. God who woke us up and God who started us on our way. God who thought that uh, his grace would extend to allow us to have another day. We're going to sing and have a good time. But would you do me a huge favor right where you are? Just lift your hands and begin to worship God. Come on, before the song kicks, the worship is your open response. Your, your open response to the goodness of God, to the majesty and the power of God. Father, we welcome you in this place. We adore you. We celebrate you. We acknowledge that there is none like you. You are God, and beside you, there is no other. We just worship you. We, we celebrate you for who you are. We celebrate that there is none above you. Father, we just invite. Your spirit's already here. What we do is we make room in our hearts to receive. Oh, yes, yes, yes. We make room in our hearts to receive. We make room in our minds to receive. We make room in our bodies to receive because we want you to have your way. We want you to do what you want to do. We want you to take over this place. We want you to be all, come on, worshipers, and just worship. Come on. That's where the worship is. It's in your voice. Uh, we will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in our mouths. We just bless the Lord. We give you glory because you are worthy to be praised. Put those hands together and give God a great praise this morning. We're going to start this service off the way we start at 9 a.m. And I want you to just look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, it's good to see you this morning. Okay, this time really mean it when you say it. Say, neighbor. <laughs> It's good to see you this morning. I don't know what God is going to do, but what I do know is that it's going to be good. Ah, uh, say that one more time. I don't know what God has in store this morning, but what I do know is that it's going to be good. Clap your hands and give God a great praise. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Who came to praise the Lord this morning? We're going to give you an opportunity to do just that. The refreshing is not a service. It is a revival. It is a movement of believers who believe that God is doing great things in this generation. So that means that even though it has begun here with us at the refreshing, it extends to family members outside. And we are so excited to have one of those family members here to lead worship with us this morning. Would you give a great crusade welcome to Sister Juchelle Brown all the way from the Calvary Baptist Church. We're going to worship God this morning. I will sing praises unto thy King, yeah. I will sing praises unto my King, yeah. He is creator of everything. He is creator of everything. I creator in all I yeah. I will exalt him, his name adore, yeah. Honor Reverence forevermore. Honor and reverence forevermore. We lift, we lift up our hands to our God, to our God, to our God, to, our God. to, our God. to, thee. to thee. We ascribe, we ascribe glory and honor and wisdom and strength to our God. I will exalt him his name on high. Yeah. And I will offer to glorify you. And I'll declare that thy name is holy. Exalt his name on forevermore. Yeah. And I'll exalt him above the heavens. He is creator. Adore you, adore you. We declare, we declare nobody like you. Nobody like you. We, worship, we worship, adore you. Adore you. We, declare, we declare nobody like you. Oh, we worship, we worship 
worship is my worship is Can you help me sing? Hallelujah. 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 My worship is my worship is for refreshing Sunday. Do you guys feel refreshed in here today? Do you feel refreshed in here today? I know I do. Praise the Lord. I'm just going to, um, well, I, first I want to welcome you. Welcome you to Crusade Christian Faith Center. This is refreshing Sunday. This is the Sunday that the youth take over in the service. I, we thank you for being here. Give yourselves a hand. I know it's Memorial Weekend. We didn't know who was going to come out, but we thank you for being here. Why don't you turn to the neighbor to your right or to your left and just say, thank you. I'm so glad to see you here today. Um, we're going to do a special tribute today. Um, we're proud to announce that our own brother, Johnny Lindsay, was honored as 2019 Teacher of the Year at Lindbergh Elementary School in Linwood School District. Stand up, brother Johnny. Stand up. We honor you today, Brother Johnny. How many of you know it's not easy to teach today? It's a different day, I know. Okay, it's very difficult and teachers are not celebrated. It's a thankless job and I know, Brother Johnny, but you, you persevered, you're dedicated, your district has recognized you and we recognize you for your 30 years of service. He teaches sixth grade. Thank you, Brother Johnny. We honor you, Crusade. Give him another round of applause. And our refreshing honoree today is Brother Willie Williams. Stand up, Brother Willie. For those of you who don't know Brother Willie, he's been a member for more than two decades here at Crusade. Brother Willie is the husband of Sharon Williams and is a loving father and devoted over-the-top grandfather. Oh, if you see him, he's showing pictures all the time. Look at my grandson, look at my grandchildren. 
Okay, Brother Willie, he's been known to leave Sunday service and go find his family out in the community and preach to each and every one of his family members. You'll find him here faithfully on Sundays and on Wednesdays serving in hospitality or in whatever facet that he's needed. And Crusade is so much better having Brother Willie here. How many of you know we need dedicated, strong members here? Thank you, Brother Willie. We acknowledge you today. I'm going to call up Sister Ariana, one of our refreshing members, and she's going to give us a testimony. Give her a hand. Hey, y'all. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I just want to first give glory and honor to God for who I am today. Um, the person before you is a person with a fuller heart, a lighter spirit, and gratitude. But about two months ago, that was not the case. Um, I was pessimistic. Um, I abused my relationship to fill voids that only God could really fill, um, as well as, like, I just had a hard time finding my internal happiness. So um, there was one Sunday, um, pastor wanted to talk to me after service, and he said that, I don't know what God is trying to do, but he's doing something, and he's, he wants to, you know, he's trying to speak to you. So I took this as an opportunity to fast and to hear from God, and um, in doing so, I went on a pretend fast. <laughs> from my boyfriend because that seemed to be more meaningful than like a piece of chicken. So um, <laughs> I went on a, a fast and this is how it kind of was, you know, from nine to nine, that was God's time. But any, si any time outside of that, that was um, Jalen's time. You know, I was just going to be with my boyfriend. But the very thing I needed to be delivered from was anxiety and the need to control everything. So um, it was kind of like, silly <laughs> that I was actually controlling the very thing I needed to be delivered from. So um, I went ahead and called Princeton, and I was like, you know, I'm kind of confused. Am I doing this right? And y'all know Princeton. He was like, hey, fam, um, I don't know what you're on, but this isn't a fast. <laughs> and so he told me why we fast. He gave me um, like a little outline to fill out. And one of the things that he shared with me is that I needed to go to God about um, the length of the fast. And as soon as he said that over the phone, 60 days was just confirmed in my spirit. And I said, oh, the devil is at work. I am not doing 60 days away from my boyfriend. What are you talking about? So um, <laughs> I had to pray about that. And reoccurring, uh, 60 days was just a reoccurring number everywhere I looked. So I just had to accept it. But I wasn't interested. So I was like, maybe we can fast next year. Like, Pastor, I'm sorry, but maybe God could speak to me next year because I'll be more ready then. <laughs> So um, pretty much I went on a 60-day fast after being convinced by this sermon that I watched. At the end of the sermon, the pastor said, the area that you keep from God will be your next problem. And I said, oh, no, we are not having any problems here. I love my boyfriend. We are not, I'm not trying to have problems. So um, I went ahead and I went right into the fast the next day for 60 days, no contact, no communication. And during that fast, I spoke in tongues for the first time. Um, I was opened up and healed by God. It was truly transforming, y'all. I could never go back to my old ways. I could never not be this close to God, ever, um, just because of just the great love that I experienced and just literally the richness of um, the time that I can't even put into words. I gained a friend. Y'all, I didn't think I needed a friend. I had a relationship. Like, I booed up. Everything is fine, right? What you need a friend for? But I gained an amazing friend who is a sister. Um, she holds me accountable as a Christian young woman. Um, she supports me. She actually did her own fast, and her testimony is amazing. Um, so it was just truly beautiful, all that I experienced. I was protective of my deliverance and um, what God was doing in me, So meaning I wasn't watching certain things. I wasn't listening to every, any and everything. Um, and it was a truly transforming experience. And I say this to say that if he did it for me, he can do it for you. <laughs> and so I just want to encourage you all on your journey. If you find yourself, you know, in a place where you're like, mm, something is missing. I don't really know what it is, but I feel like just something about my life is missing. Or if you have that crunch, if you have that, you know, boyfriend who's taking up your space or fill in the blank, whatever that thing might be that is keeping, you know, um, a space for God's existence, <laughs> Um, go ahead and free it up and try it fast. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. God did for me in hours what I've been working on for years, y'all. Like, I'm not even playing with you. So I just want to let y'all know he's my healer, my father, my friend, my protector, my everything. And 
Um, if there's any way I can support you on your journey, please let me know. I'm very open to sharing my experiences and more detail and all. And so I love y'all and thank you so much. <laughs> In case your situation has turned upside down and all that you've accomplished is now on the ground. You don't have to stay in the shape that you're in. The potter wants to put you back together again. Oh, the potter wants to put you back together Case you have fallen by the wayside of life, dreams and vision shattered, you're all broken inside. You don't have to stay in the shape that you're in. Oh, the potter wants to put you back together again oh the potter wants to put you back together again in case your situation has turned upside down and all that you've accomplished is now on the ground you don't have to stay in the shape that you're in. Oh, the potter wants to put you back, back together again. You who are broken, stop by. Salvation, salvation in the potter's house. 
there's everlasting salvation. Salvation. good not to pause and worship I said it's too good not to pause and worship you praise God like you've never been broken before you praise God like you don't know what it is to have God put you back together and and have you piecemealed and look different and feel different you you praise him like you've never been through some stuff that that made you think i'll never be myself again but isn't it wonderful that god came in and said i can put back together what life broke oh you don't want to have i said i can put back together what life broke i i can put back together what relationships broke i can put back together what fear broke i can put back together what grief broke would you take a moment and praise him like he put you back together would you praise him like one day he reached way down i feel your holy ghost he had to reach through some stuff but once he got his hand all the way down he picked me up and put me back together would you praise him hallelujah we 
bless you, oh God, for being good. Father, thank you for being the God who is powerful enough to create a thing, yet loving enough to restore it. Father, we thank you for our creation, but life had its way. And in the midst of life's impact upon us, we experience brokenness. But thank you that our brokenness was a condition, not a statement of our identity. Because even when we were broken, you with your sovereign hand and love and power said, I could fix that. So Father, we thank you and we worship with the enthusiasm that we do, with the passion that we do, with the fortitude, with the volume that we do, because we are a people who know what it is to be put back together. So Father, we ask that you instill us now. Now that we've been put together by your power, fill us with what you desire for us to have. We were not put together for our own aesthetic or beauty, but we were put together that we might give you praise, worship, glory, and that we might be used of you for your purpose. So God, do what you want to do through the word and through the rest of our time together. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Anybody glad that the potter wants to and is able to put you back together again? Hallelujah. Can we bless God for everybody who has ministered this morning? The presence of God has already been made so strongly evident by the power that is in all those who have gone forth and ministered. We praise God again for Sister Juchelle Brown joining us as guest worship leader this morning. We absolutely praise God for our worship team called the Voices of Refreshing. We bless God for them. What a powerhouse y'all are. Y'all did your good singing today. In case you don't know, that was Brother Marcus Paul and Sister Sean Moore who just absolutely ministered to us that the potter wants to put us back together again. We're going to go to the book of Luke, the 15th chapter. A familiar story, a familiar passage, and a familiar parable that we hope to um, articulate some life for this present moment in today. We honor God for our musicians. And we, yeah. Last but not least, we honor God for um, our bishop, our pastor, my spiritual father. Bishop Virgil Patterson. It takes a true leader to do two things. To first of all, recognize the need for intergenerational partnership. Most leaders don't even see that as a need for their congregation. But the second thing is it takes a lot for a leader to then value that partnership. There are some who recognize the need but are not loving enough or secure enough to value the contribution and the investment and just the space. And I love it because this is not something that he does on Sunday. His love for us is something that he walks Monday through Saturday from a mentoring perspective, praying for us, loving us, um, and coming here. It was an honor um, to get a pastor, but God blew my mind in giving me a spiritual father. And so um, I am so grateful to be a son and to, uh, to walk and to follow him. So we honor our pastor. Uh, we honor Pastor Jerry today for her consistent love and leadership to us. And she will be back doing this the right way next week. <laughs> Appreciate it to us, okay? Let's look at Luke 15, verse 11. Jesus in Luke chapter 15, has undergone the work of telling parables to communicate the idea that what was once lost through the power, the love, and the might of God can one day be found. He tells the story of a sheep that was lost. Agriculture would have meant something to the audience. They would have understood that uh, you go after the one sheep that's lost, not just because you have this weird affection for sheep, 
but because you understand that in that one is a tremendous amount of value economically in the system and everything that you have to put forth. You leave the 99 for the one because the one had enough value for you to chase it down. He tells a story about a coin. He says that perhaps we could see how easy and how much it would make sense for somebody who had, who had lost a very specific coin. That when they had lost it to sweep the entire house, to mess stuff up, to rearrange stuff for the purpose of finding it. Why? Not just because the person has an affection for silver, but because there's value attached to it. So Jesus is already on a roll with these first two stories, and he concludes with what is by far one of the most eloquently told stories to ever be recorded in the biblical narrative. Even those who are non-believers would look at this text and see that it is done so brilliantly, so exquisitely, so passionately that uh, even Tyler Perry could take a few notes from how Jesus tells this story. Shonda Rhimes couldn't write it more passionately than this. Ava DuVernay, in her glory, wishes that she could arrive at the simplistic yet passionate and even deeply spiritual nature of this story. And though it is told to an audience 15 and 20 and thousands of years ago, an audience that was somewhat different than what we are here gathered today, the story speaks through generations to us to communicate that what once was lost now has the ability to be found. He opens the story this way in verse 11. And he said a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, hey, dad, listen, I know you got it. I know you got that bread, fam. Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he, the father, divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him unto his fields to feed swine. And he would have fain filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no one gave to him. This is our central verse. And when he came to himself. Ooh, my God. Let me read that again. And when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, but I perish with hunger. So my response is, I will arise and I'll go to my father and I will say to him, father, I've sinned against where first? Heaven. And then I've sinned against what? Thee. And I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. So here's what I want you to do, Dad. I'm going to tell him, Dad, just make me one of your hired servants. That's going to be important. Verse 20. And he arose and he came to his father. Oh, I love the way Jesus paints this. He says in all of his cinematic glory, look at this picture. Oh, I can hear the strings coming as this next verse says. But when he was yet a great way off, his father, what? Saw him. And the immediate response, the Bible tells us, is that the undergirding emotion under the father's sight is what? Compassion. And he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Now his eldest son was in the field and as he came and drew nigh to the house he heard music and dancing. They was turning up in there y'all. And he called one of the servants and he say uh, come here Kim folk. What these things mean, that is the ratchet translation. If you haven't got it, see me, I'll sell you a copy, okay? And he said unto him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he's received him. How did he receive him? Safe and sound. 
But the brother has a different response than the father. The father through sight is moved by compassion. The brother by what he hears is moved to anger. And he wouldn't go into the party. So his father came out of the party and entreated him. He indulged him in dialogue. He saw, bro, what's, what's going on, fam? He entreated him. And he answered to his father saying, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I've been the good kid. I didn't transgress at any time your commandment. And yet you never gave me what you're giving him that I could turn up with my friends. I got friends too, daddy. But as soon as the misfit was come, as soon as the one that was out there doing something he had no business, that which devoured what you had worked for. This is so interesting. He devoured your living. He devoured what had come through a lot of pain and hard work for you. He didn't honor your work for it and he wasted it. With harlots. And yet you've killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, son, you're always with me. And all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. For the next few fleeting moments I have with you this morning, I want to preach to you from the subject, I'm getting back to me. I'm, I'm getting back to me. If you'll turn your attention uh, back to that verse, verse 17, the moment of our sermonic presentation today will hinge on these words, and when he came to himself. The interesting thing to unpack about this story is that the son, by the time we reach verse 17, has lost everything. But he realized that it was not everything that he should be sad about. It was the most important thing that he lost that he needed to go back home. It wasn't money that was the greatest loss. It was not status that was the greatest loss. It was not friends that was the greatest loss. It was not food that was the greatest loss. The reason why verse 17 is important is because this son who has gone from home realizes that I could lose anything, but what's detrimental is when I lose myself. And I think the problem is we guard ourselves against minor losses while being content with losing ourselves. Can I say that again? We guard ourselves against minor losses that we can recover from while all the time being complicit in the one loss that could make us lose everything. We protect our relationship while all the time losing ourselves. We protect our jobs while all the time losing ourselves. We protect our money while all the time losing ourselves. And it concerns me that there are those of us who are located in the presence of God and in the house of God asking for God to protect everything except our understanding of who we are. His entire life changed the moment he came to himself. And my question to you is, have you been you lately? Have you been you lately? Because being lost has nothing to do with location and all to do with your perception of who you are. And more importantly, your perception of who God is. I know you know your job, but have you been you? I know you're making better money than you have in a while, but have, have you been, have you been you? Or did you stop being you at the last point of trauma you experienced? Did, did you stop being you once God finally gave you what you asked for and life started being a little bit happier? Did, did, did you stop being you the moment somebody didn't believe in your dream? Did you stop being you the last time you felt like God was taking too long? And so out of protest, you decided that God said, you're not operating on my timeline. I'm going to go do me for a little bit. One of the things that was very interesting to me, I was at work. And you know, when you be doing your thing and work or preaching, the beautiful thing is it can be used as an armor that you see what I do so you don't have to see through me to who I am. 
For those of you who are talented or gifted, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But sometimes you're not doing your thing because you really believe in it or purpose, but you're doing it because it will distract people from seeing the pieces of you that you're not ready to acknowledge just yet. So listen to me lead worship because you'll think I'm okay. Look at how nice my house is so you won't see that my marriage is in shambles because I am unhealed emotionally. Just, just look at what I do well. Look at my title. That's why I want you to call me by my title because Pastor Princeton is good, but Princeton by himself got a couple of issues. So look at the pastor part because that'll impress you. So it is. I was at work, y'all. Can I tell you my business real quick? I was at work, right? And I was over it. Anybody else been over? Don't look at me like that. Like y'all just love your job all the time. Okay, fantastic. So you religious and in denial. Okay. I was over it because I felt like I wasn't seeing enough momentum in the direction of where I wanted to go from a career standpoint. And I'd apply the thing after thing and apply the thing after thing and apply the thing after thing. And here's the interesting part. I would apply to something and people do this whole thing. They go, oh my God, Princeton, you're perfect for that. Why, why didn't we think about, why, why don't we think about this? You're, you're going to be amazing. You got this. I'd apply and thank you so much for applying. You know, unfortunately right now, then, you know, you got to say something about something to cover up the real answer. We just, we just didn't want you, you know. And the impact of enduring over time in the confines of God made me frustrated because I felt like I had already timed out of God's lockbox. So the fact that I felt like I was mentally ahead of God's timeline produced an internal frustration. But I wanted them to just see manager Princeton not Princeton. If you see manager Princeton, you'd say, he's so inspiring. And he walks around all day saying it's lit and he sings. It sounds like he's singing slave songs, but he, he sings all the time. He's just so chipper and great. But one day I had a working lead. I'll never forget her. And I was going about my day in usual conversation. And she said to me, I'll never forget these words, she said, you haven't been yourself. First of all, it's a little upset, okay? Because the whole reading people, psychology, like prophetic, that's me, okay? I can read you. What you're not about to do is pull the whole emotional health prophetic thing and see me. That's what you're not about to do, okay? I'm the pastor. You, ma'am, I don't know, but you just... Right? So first of all, the first reaction was disgust. Second of all, the second reaction was, how does she know? My third reaction was, maybe I haven't been. It's the point where many of us would refer to as rock bottom where nothing's happening, nothing's progressing, and so you look and you say, maybe I haven't been myself. And you start tracing behaviors that used to be a part of you and your walk with God that can no longer be identified. You used to be kinder. You used to have a healthier outlook. You used to carve out time with God instead of just falling into time with God. Let me explain what falling into time with God means. Like, you used to plan fast, now you fall into a fast because you ain't got no money for lunch anyway. So you just say, Lord, can we call it a fast? Because I ain't got nothing for Del Taco anyway, okay? That's called falling into time with God, right? <laughs> you like wasn't going to call prayer waves, but since you didn't call nobody yesterday, prayer waves was the last thing you called. So when you went to call your friend, you just hear prayer waves. He was like, oh God, I done ended up here, Jesus. Can I hang up without them knowing? 
you identify that there are particular patterns that used to be a part of you, that used to be a part of your engagement with yourself and with God. And, and in the midst of the disgust, in, in the midst of struggling with it, in the midst of, of wondering uh, like what is going on, there's a central question that must be asked of ourselves and then must also be asked of Luke chapter 11. And that is, how did I get here? And you know what's crazy is? You can look and realize that you've been in something three, four years and ain't been yourself since it happened and never knew it. Been in a whole relationship. Y'all about to get married. And ain't realized through the whole thing you haven't been yourself. You got 10, 12, 15,000 followers and 300 church members and all that kind of stuff and are just now realizing that the question we must ask to the son as he is planted there in Luke chapter 11 verse 17 is, hey, Brosif, how did you get here, fam? A couple of things I want to lift up to you and we're gone. The first answer is how did he get to the place where he lost the most important thing? How did he get to the place where he lost himself? The first is found in verse 11. Verse 11 is where he asked his father, give me the portion of goods that belongs to me. Now, let's do a little bit of contextual situation here. What is he asking for? He's asking for his father's inheritance. How does Jewish culture work? Now, because the father has worked for stuff his entire life, there is a series of material goods that will be passed down. And then if we trace this all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob, there's also a spoken blessing that will be received, right? When it comes to the material inheritance that's going to be passed down, they were entitled to it by birth, right? But it was going to be given to them at the passing of the father, right? But there was a clause. The clause is the father could give it to them before time as a gift just once. So watch this. He says to his dad, hey, give me what's mine. It's not what he wanted that was the problem. It was when he wanted it that was the problem. I need you to see in the text that what he wanted was going to be his regardless. But the first space he began to, to lose himself was because he wasn't concerned with the money, he was concerned with time. The first place we begin to lose ourselves is when we ask God, I know you've promised me this, but why won't you let me have it right now? Rushing is the beginning of losing yourself. When you rush, hear this, write this in your notes. The cost you pay for rushing the process is yourself. Write that down. You can rush it if you want to, but it comes with a cost. And the cost is, if you rush, you're going to lose you. If you rush, you are going to lose who God is making you. You're going to lose your wholeness. You're going to lose your healing. You're going to lose who you know yourself to be. It was not what he wanted. That was destined for him. The problem was he looked at God and said, I know that you promised that you're going to use me. Well, why I can't be promoted right now? I know you said you've assigned for somebody to spend the rest of my life with to glorify and honor you. But why I can't just make something happen like that right now? I know that you've determined for me to prosper, but why can't I turn a few tricks to get that money right now? The first way he ended up in this position of having lost himself was because he rushed what was, watch this, already his. And can I tell you the reason why you rush? is because you've forgotten that it's already yours. You rush, watch this, the reason why you rush is because you don't think you're really going to get it. Mm -hmm. That's the reason I got to do it right now. I don't really believe that this is going to happen for me, so I need to rush it, why? So that I can walk by sight and not by faith. I need to rush a relationship because I don't believe God has one for me. I need to rush a job because I don't believe God's gonna do it. I need to rush a career because I don't believe God's gonna honor it. So let me speed this along so that I can walk by what I see instead of believing that the inheritance of my father, I feel your Holy Ghost, already belongs to me if I will just agree with the timeline of God. 
He lost himself because he rushed. It was his all along. And had he really known that, then he would have known that he could have just chilled where he was. But the first thing, the first place where he begins to lose himself is because he does not have a healthy relationship with time. If you are going to follow God, faith ought to make you have, write this down, a healthy relationship with time. If you walk by faith, it ought to make you have a healthy relationship with time. That means that you're not anxious to move before you should. And it means that you're not slothful to not move when God is telling you to. The reason why we don't have a healthy relationship with time is because we don't understand this principle. That time is a construct. Everybody say that. Time is a construct. Time is a construct. That means that God made time. What we know about God is that God is eternal. Everybody say eternal. Eternal means that time don't mean nothing to God. God does not exist in time. Watch this. God created time so that we could have a framework to understand life in. If he had allowed us to just exist eternally, could you imagine trying to plan something and be like, hey, uh, we're going to go to lunch, but it's going to be at eternal 30. Like... You see your head starting to hurt right now? That's because you were not created to exist in eternity. You were created. So time is a construct, right? So watch this. This is why it seems like God is not moved by our prayers. It's not that he's not moved by how we feel. He's just not moved by time like we are. He sits outside of time. So the next time your anxiety is being caused by an unhealthy relationship with time, what you need to ask yourself is, what is time anyway? What is time? Oh, I always thought I'd be here by 20. What is time? I, I really was hoping that my first house, would, what is time? I, I really wanted my career to tell, but what is time? What is time but a measurement for you to understand where you are, not to, be, not to create expectations for yourself by when you should be where? Because you weren't born from time. Your destiny wasn't born from time. So why are you being held captive by it? I wish that the son had known that time is a construct and I could be doing stuff with this time that I'm in the house. I could be doing something in this moment. God exists out of time. This is why this God who exists out of time could tell Sarah that she was going to have a baby after 90. See, the reason why you look sideways at that is because you're bound by time. But God looked at the 90-year-old woman and said, what is time? Oh my goodness, that's why he looked down out of heaven and was able to put his shine on a 12-year-old named Jehoshaphat when it was time for him to become the king of the world. See, you struggle with that because you think a 12-year-old can't do nothing, but God looked at a 12-year-old and said, what is time? That's why God looked down and was able to send Jesus through 42 generations. And there was 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament and why everybody was freaking out about whether or not God had left them. God was just chilling knowing Jesus was on the other side of it and he looked at 400 years and said what is time that's why he was able to look in the beginning and he looked at the end and he was able to look from Genesis all the way through Revelation and still think that you were worth creating because he looked at it all and he said your faith must cause you to have a healthy relationship with time, a healthy relationship with pace, a healthy relationship with rest, a healthy relationship with submission, a healthy relationship with patience, a healthy relationship with discipline. The first way the son began to lose himself was because he was uncomfortable with God's time. The second way he began to lose himself was because he looked around and he said, I'm tired of this church. That's for 10 of y'all to get that joke. I'm tired of this house. And he looked at his environment. And he looked at being at home. And he looked at having to follow rules. And he looked at what being at home required. And he felt like it contained him. The moment we begin to lose ourselves is when we look at structure as slavery instead of protection write that down 
We lose ourselves the moment we see structure as slavery, because I'm a speaker, I like when they're all S's, when we see structure as slavery, not safety. I like that. That's the tweetable version. If you're going to tweet, first of all, follow me at Princeton Parker. Second of all, tweet the second way I told you, not the first way, because the S's are going to line up. It's a speaker thing. Don't worry about it, okay? I appreciate you in Jesus' name. He saw structure as slavery, not safety. So he looked at his life, watch this, and he said, this is keeping me from living my best life. Instead of, this is anchoring me so I can live my best life. The scriptures are going to be the same. What you will have the option to do is how you want to look at them. There are some that will look at the written word of God, the word of God as presented in scripture, and they will say, that's keeping me from living my best life. And then there are those that will look at the same set of scripture and say, yo, that is my best life. Part of the wrestling is when you look at what God has put around you as boundaries. There are two moments in every person's life. There's the moment that you accept your calling, and then there's the moment that you make peace with it. Say it again. If you're taking notes, write that down. There are two moments in your life. The moment you accept your calling, and then there's the moment you make peace with it. What does that mean? There's the moment that you accept that this is who God has told me I am. And then there's the moment where you're finally okay with it. Okay with what it costs. Okay with the boundaries. Okay with the fact that it forces you to live differently. I was four years old when I accepted my calling to be a preacher of the gospel. I'm 25 and just now trying to make peace with it. Because my calling means that I don't get to live the same life that some of my friends get to live. The calling means that there are certain expectations, there are certain boundaries, there are certain things I have to look for and be aware of. Now, it doesn't make anybody better, it's just different. Because whatever calling God has ascribed to you will come with its own boundaries that you have to make peace with. But the problem was he understood the calling for him to be a son. But he had not made peace with what that court required him to do in the house. So he said, it's more freeing to explore. It's more fun to do it outside the house. And he let his frustration and his inability to make peace with what the father required of him convince him that that wasn't the best way. And so he says to his dad, listen, give me my money. And what's interesting is, I don't read in this parable where the father had a discussion with him. I don't read where the father pulled him aside and said, um, hey, you know what? You ought to think about this before you do it, son. I, I don't read where the father jumped in um, and said, you know, hey, uh, why do you want to do this? I want us to note how the dad handles departure. Can I give you how he handles it? He doesn't. You know why? Because you cannot protect people from process. Watch this. I don't care how much you love them. I don't care how much wisdom you got. And I don't care how well intended you are. Listen to me. You cannot make them ready. Some of you are in relationships right now because you see the idealized version of that person. And you think if you love them enough, they will become what you see. So you have put the entire burden of their maturity on your back. And it's only going to leave you with your heart broken. How many of us are engaged in arguments and discussions right now trying to get somebody to think a different way, trying to get somebody to choose? I just want you to see you the way I see you. And can I tell you, you're a waste of effort when what you need to do, can I tell you that in this next season of your life, the Lord is about to anoint you to say something very prophetic, okay? It's about to be very prophetic, so I just want you to open up your mind because it's going to be super, super deep, okay? It's like Greek and Hebrew, and it's a little Latin mixed in. It's even got some Spanish in there somewhere. I just want you to be prepared because in this next season of your life, the Lord is about to anoint you to say one word 
Okay. You missed it. You missed it. The Lord is about to give you a very strong anointing to look at some things going on in your life and some people who are trying to leave and be like, okay. There are some people who have been trying to cut themselves out of your life, but because you're afraid to be alone, you're trying to hold on to her just so you don't have to navigate life without them. But in this next season, if you don't want to lose who you are, you better get a strong anointing on the inside of you to look at them like the father of the son and say, okay, you don't even know what you're doing, but okay. You don't know how risky it is out there, but okay. I don't really want you to go, but okay. I feel like you might mess up your life, but okay. Because I cannot protect you from the process. Because if I protect protect you from the process I'll be protecting you from wholeness if I protect you from the process I'll be protecting you from deliverance if I protect you from the process I'll be protecting you from you learning who God is for yourself I love you but you're just not ready I'm gonna miss you but you're just not ready you're my son but you're just not ready I thought we was gonna get married but you're just not ready I really wanted to work here, but you're just not ready. I cannot free you. It is not your job to make someone ready. Because let me tell you what you've done when you do that. You've convinced yourself that you are God. You've convinced yourself that you can say something to turn a heart. Or you could do something to heal somebody's trauma. You don't have that kind of power. And that's why you're so empty. Because you are trying to work out trauma that exceeds you. You are trying to work out journeys that you don't have the bandwidth for. When I, when I realized that in the scripture, that changed my life. The dad didn't wrestle. Now watch this. He knew there's a possibility that his son may never come back. And the reason why you won't let go is because what scares you is that God might take it and never give it back. If, if, if I break up with you, that, that might mean that I really have to walk this out for real, for real, with just me. And God said, yeah, that's the place of faith I'm looking for. Can you trust, watch this, can you trust what you worked for in my hands? Not just your child. Can you trust your career? I hear you, Holy Ghost. I hear you, Holy Ghost. Can you trust this ministry? Watch this. It wasn't even yours that I gave to you. Can you trust all the work you've put in and put it in my hands? The dad said, all right, this is not what I want, but okay. Because he was able to see beyond his request and see that what his son needed was a personal encounter with God. He needed a personal encounter for him to come back to himself. You know what he realized? He looked beyond his request and he was able to see, my son doesn't know himself. He's not greedy, he just doesn't know himself. He's not lustful, he doesn't know himself. And even though I've worked to give him my last name, I can't provide him with experience to show him who he is. My time is running out. In many senses, when we try to protect people, we're not protecting them. We're protecting our fear of being without them. Why don't you write that down? In many senses, when I try to protect someone from the process they need to go through, I'm not really protecting them. Most of it is self-serving. I'm protecting my fear of being without them. I'm protecting my fear of having to reconcile the fact that my dreams, as I thought they were going to come true, are not. Many of us are protecting our own reputation. You never wanted to be known by your kid doing X, Y, or Z. Particularly in the church. Man, people struggle with it. Particularly if they were in some, some seed of leadership or something in the church where there was all this expectation that because you were this, your kids must also be this. You have to interrogate, like, where did that come from? Right? You know, we steward the people in our lives and we give them back to God. And they got to make their own decision about whether or not they will serve. And so you're walking around with your head hung down because of where your family member or child is in their journey, and that's not your business, it's God's. And we have to ask, like, am I really protecting them or am I protecting my reputation? Because I don't like that, my kid, you know? All 
all right, everybody's kid. <laughs> like, everybody's kid, everybody's cousin, everybody's mama, everybody's daddy, all right? Can we just all admit we broken? They sang the Potter's House, okay? We, you who are broken, everybody. <laughs> you who are broken, whole church. The next way he lost himself, verse 13, he went into a far country. This speaks about a couple of things. This speaks about location, but it also speaks about ideology. Um, it is, uh, oh my goodness, who's the, uh, who's the faith author? Mm. Ah, Augustine, one of the church fathers. Augustine says that the far country represents forgetfulness of God. So he departed home, which was the area where he was raised, but he also departed his understanding of God. He pursued other ideologies, other ways of thinking about life. And one of the biggest things that's happening right now is that for most of us, in our pursuit of self, in our pursuit of thinking that we're going to do us for a little bit, the space where many people turn is to other ideologies besides faith. I'm going to go into humanism. I'm going to go into hedonism. I'm going to go explore. Um, there's a lot of exploration of uh, ancient uh, African mythologies and African religions and approaches, right? Because that's part of uh, this process that you will see when folks have lost themselves or are going on that journey, not necessarily just lost themselves. When they're going on that journey, part of it is not just where they go, but the mindset they pursue once they're there. Anybody else see somebody on Facebook? You'd be like, oh, you'd be posting some stuff. You'd be posting way out there. It's revelation of the far country approach, right? They've gone to a far country. Augustine says that that represents forgetfulness of God. Verse 13, verse 14 says that he wasted his substance on riotous living. The word riotous in the Greek means a sotos. Everybody say a sotos. See, y'all speak Greek. Go tell them that at work tomorrow. I'm just tell them the Lord gave me the gift of Greek. They be like, do you? A sotos. It means riotous. <laughs> Please do it and then tell me how it goes, okay? That's going to be great. I just might do it at work tomorrow. Just be like, you know what? That cast member is really demonstrating a sotos behavior. They'd be like, but what? It means riotous. It's Greek. I just don't even know the Lord gave it to me. Uh, it means a sotos, right? Watch this. It means lacking restraint or indulgent in vices. Can I tell you one of the ways that you know trauma is at work? Because somebody has no control. Control is an operation of wholeness. Oh my goodness. Write that down. Self-control is an operation of wholeness. People who are still broken emotionally and spiritually do not have the propensity to make self-control decisions. Now, here's what's interesting. This should also affect the way that you disciple non-believers. We beat people in the heads with Bibles expecting them to have whole behavior before they've been whole. So you're sending the people to hell instead of getting them healed first. I'm not whole enough to live your version of holiness. <laughs> Self-control is an act. It is a product of wholeness. Because he did not know himself, he couldn't budget his money. <laughs> because he didn't know himself, he didn't know that messing around with that many women sexually was bad for him. He was just getting it in. He just thought like, okay, like it's pleasurable, ain't nobody being hurt by it, whatever, right? Well, you don't know yourself, and this is why sometimes we have to be able to look beyond how a person is acting and to be able to recognize what is the internal conversation going on. What are they asking for out of life? What are they seeking for out of life? Riotous living means that he got there and got out of control. Let me pull to a close. The Bible says that he got a job. Well, first of all, famine hit the land. He wasted all his money. Girls stopped thinking he was cute because he didn't have no money because he wasn't cute because like, he was cute. He was cute because he had money. So there's that. He shouldn't have left. The, you can't, like, why are you going to leave the house if you're not cute? Like, he just probably should have stayed in the house, especially <laughs> not being cute. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you're not going to be cute. Go ahead and just stay in there and you and dad just chill out. And just, you know. <laughs> That's why I stay saved. I ain't cute enough to not be saved. I'm not. I'm not. I ain't cute enough to just be out here like, hey, girl, what? What? <laughs> and I would try it, and it all would be like, oh, you go to church. No, I don't. Oh, my God, you're the preacher? You're so adorable. No. Nah. Hate that. Hate it. Anyway, neither here nor there. The Bible says that he gets a job, right? Um, he gets a job, and his job is to feed pigs. Yeah, this is good. Remember, 
this is situated in Jewish culture and context. Pigs is kind of like the logo of dirty. It's kind of like the highlight reel of like, oh my God, ill. Like pigs is totes that, like totally, right? It's the swine, unclean. Watch this. He gets, <laughs> that's all right. I appreciate you. She said watch it. That's what I'm talking about. Don't do stuff like that. I'll preach 30 more minutes. My time is up. I got to close this. I got to close this. I got to get it to the best part. He gets a job feeding what he has been taught is unclean. Because one of the ways that God will humble you is by making you serve what you used to look down on. You can think you bad if you want to, fam. You better enjoy it, bruh. Because in a minute, you're going to be waitressing for some pigs, bruh. And that's what it took. Watch this. And the Bible says, this is crazy. The Bible says that he would have wanted to eat what the pigs ate. But look at what the scripture says. But none would give it to him. Because when God is getting ready to talk to you, he'll even block your lowest desires. Because he has let you get to that place not to ensnare you, but just to wake you up. So you'll get to the point where you want some stuff that ain't God, but still can't get no action. Oh my goodness. Have you ever wanted to bust a move and couldn't? Have you ever texted your old booty call and all of a sudden they stopped responding? Have you ever tried to shake some things that used to work back in the day? And all, have you ever tried to sell again and all of a sudden you ain't got the juice like you had to no more? It's because God has gotten to the point where he's not trying to break you. He just wants you to confront your own brokenness. So now that you're thinking about it, I'm not even going to let you become a snare to you. And... I got so much more to give you, but we got time. So, verse 17. Verse 17 says that he came to himself. You already have church and go home? He came to himself because he realized nothing about my original circumstance has changed except my relationship with me. He came to himself. Now watch this. He started to want to go home. In verse 11, he was sick of home. But by the time we get down here, he got homesick. <laughs> I said, he started out being sick of home, but he went through enough life to make him homesick. Can I tell you that the uneasiness that you're feeling, it's a little deeper than just being moody. It's a little deeper than just being uh, upset today. It's a little deeper than just having a bad day. It's a, it's a little deeper than just needing a blunt. It's a little deeper than a glass of wine. It's, it's a little deeper than sex. What, what you're feeling is homesick right now. What you're feeling is the distance between where you are now and where God used to have you. But can I tell you that just like that man as he was sitting there, all by himself, God sent me to tell you that home is still where you left it. I feel God. God sent me to tell you that home is still wherever you departed, whatever it was that took you away from home, Whatever it was that made you lose yourself, whatever was the last point where you dropped who you were, God told me to tell you I'm still right here and home is where you left it. The problem is, do you see yourself enough yet? And how does he come to see himself? He sees himself by remembering his father. This is the punchline. He sees himself because he says, surely my father. So the Bible says that he gets up and he makes a whole speech. And he says, this is what I'm going to say. I'm about to go home. He goes home, and the Bible says that while he was a great way off, the father ran to him. What God wants to share with you today is that there are some of you that the reason why you are in this space where you've not been yourself and you won't go back to God is because you are ashamed of the distance between where you are now and the self you used to know. You've had so much happen to you and you've done so much dirt that that distance intimidates you. So you feel like you are out of the zone of recovery. So you say, had I come back a year into that relationship, I could be recoverable. 
Had I come back uh, uh, a month after I started doing that or, or a couple weeks after I experienced that, I could still be recovered. But now at this point, but can I minister a word prophetically? God is saying, I am your father and I have grace that makes up the distance. Oh, you don't hear me. He says, all I need you to do is head in my direction and I'll take care of distance. You didn't hear me. God is saying, if you take care of direction, if you just head in my direction, I'll make up the distance. I'll make up the distance in your heart. I'll make up the distance in your degree program. I'll make up the distance in your mind. I'll make up the distance in your finance. I'll make up the distance in your marriage. I'll make up the distance in your ministry. Is there anybody glad that all God said was come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. All I did was turn around and I saw him run into me. All I did was do an about face and I saw him coming to me and he stepped through my trauma and he stepped through my insecurities and he stepped through my fear and he stepped through my addiction he stepped through my bad decisions he stepped through my unbelief he stepped through every mistake he stepped through every soul tie he stepped over everything that was in my way he ran over my pain he ran over my depression he ran over my insignificance he ran over my frustration he ran over my unbelief and he said Princeton you don't have enough strength to get to me but I've got enough grace to get to you is there anybody glad that you are existing in this present moment moment because grace made up the distance oh glory to God I'm done I promise he goes home and the punchline is this I'll talk about the brother some other time the punchline is this that what happened was he came in and he got a robe he got a ring and he got a fatted cap now I don't have time to tell you what all those mean. They all have really deep, significant meanings that I wrote down. We ain't got that kind of time, okay? Here's the point. He got back to himself and came home and realized that the whole point of them gifts was to remind him that even though he had been away, even though he had made some mistakes, even though he wasn't the best representation, he was still a son. Ah! Oh, you didn't hear what I just said. I said, even though he was a disgrace, he was still a son. Even though he was tripping, he was still a son. He had had a lot of sex while he was gone, but he was still a son. He had wasted his father's money, but he was still a son. And I just came to tell you that the reason why you've got to get back to yourself is because you are still who God said you are. I know you made some mistakes, but you are still who God said you are. I know you lost yourself for a little bit, but you are still who God said you are. I know you stopped believing for a while, but you are still who God says you are. I know you've been drunk before, but you are still who God says you are. I know that you spent too much time in that relationship, but you are still who God said you are. I know that you didn't do your homework, but you are still who God says you are. And the moment that you remember that is the moment that you will get out of your pit and say surely there is room at my father's house I've come to tell you there's room for you I don't care what you've done in your life there is room for you I don't care what happened before there is room for you and when you come to yourself I have a prophetic word for you uh, that was spoken by the great hip hop prophets uh, and they would open like this uh, they would say I'm back like I never left is there anybody who's gonna have some church with me and say that when God is finished you're gonna be where he told you you were going to be and your testimony will be I'm back like I never left I took some years off but I'm back like I never left I made some bad decisions but I'm back like I never left I wasn't always where I should have been but I'm back like I never left because the blood of Jesus it picked me up and it turned me around and then it placed my feet on a solid ground I just came to tell somebody that it's time to get back to you you haven't been yourself lately but it's time to get back to 
prayer. It's time to get back to discipline. It's time to get back to wholeness. It's time to get back to your education because God is not a man that he should lie nor the son of man that he should ever repent. I'm leaving y'all. I got brunch later this afternoon but before we go can I tell y'all that what I love about it is that I take my cues from Jesus. See, the prodigal son was able to look at his situation and say, this is not who I am. And that's what made him get up and get back to himself. But the prodigal son is all right. But I like to look unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of my faith. Jesus came down through 42 generations and he lived my experience and then you know the story they hung him high can we have church y'all they stretched him wide he hung his head but for me he died they took him off the cross and they buried him in a tomb he had literally put on death he was wearing death and he was wearing sin but all of a sudden Friday it was all right Saturday it was all right, but early I feel like preaching. Early Sunday morning, he looked at the grave and he said, this is not who I am. And he got out of the grave with all power in his hands. Get up out of your problem. Get up out of your wallowing. Get up out of your self-pity. Get up out of your regret. Get up out of your frustration. Get up out of your timeline. Get up out of your confusion. Let God bring you back to yourself. I've got news for every demon in the pit of hell. Princeton is getting back to Princeton. Princeton is getting back to purpose. Princeton is getting back to love. Princeton is getting back to the word. Princeton is getting back to peace. I won't let a relationship. I won't let a denied job. I won't let loneliness keep me from being myself. Because above all, I am a son. And if you know you belong to God, give him a shout of praise.